um, just a really quick prayer request. <laughs> Any of you intercessors out there, we have amazing internet normally, but it's being a bit naughty this morning. Um, I don't think that's a coincidence. So we are just declaring that it will hold out. Um, so we're carrying on our firm foundation series and um, I get to do another talk on wholeness. It's a huge topic, um, but I, I think a really important one. So when I did my first talk on this, um, I used a quote to just try and help us kind of frame what we mean by wholeness or biblical wholeness. And I read out that the state of being perfectly well in body, soul, which includes mind, will and emotions and spirit. So that's quite a high aspiration for us all, <laughs> to be perfectly well in all of those parts of um, our life. And I looked at the importance of forgiving others as a really important step in terms of our um, personal wholeness and also in terms of our physical wholeness, not tolerating what Jesus came to terminate. So in preparing for this morning, I was like, God, what, I've got 20 minutes. What do you want me to focus on? And I felt that um, he wanted me to touch on kind of, um, I use the phrase spiritual wholeness, and it's a talk or a topic that certainly in my 35 plus years of going to church, I have not really heard it be um, preached on a lot on a Sunday morning. Um, so if there are any tricky questions afterwards, I'm very happy to give you Vince's number and to go to him. Um, but I'm going to focus on how the enemy tries to prevent us from being whole. Now the devil is absolutely terrified of healed up and whole Christians who live in their identity as royal children of God because they will do such destruction to his kingdom. I want to early on in this talk declare the truth that we have a huge victorious God and a little defeated enemy who likes to puff himself up. But basically he is just a fallen angel and he is no equal to God. So please remember that as we're going on. Just going back to the cross. Um, sorry, we <laughs> um, if we look at Colossians 2, um, this is talking about what Jesus accomplished on the cross. It said, then Jesus made a public spectacle of all of the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all of their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his. What an amazing verse about, um, yeah, the power and the victory of the cross. We don't have to fear the enemy in any way because of what Jesus did. However, the enemy doesn't actually really like us, children of God. In 1 Peter 5.8, it says, be alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So in a nutshell, um, his plans for us aren't the best. <laughs> he doesn't have our best interests at heart. And he does, he tries to influence us. In John 8, he's described as the master of deception. Unfortunately, the devil doesn't walk around holding a big neon sign saying, this is me. And that's why Peter says that we need to be alert, to be aware of some of the ways that he might try and influence our lives. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 27, do not give the devil a foothold. And in this context, Paul is writing to Christians and he's urging them to not give the devil a way into their lives. And a foothold is a secure position from which further progress may be made. And certainly talking for myself, I have absolutely no desire to have any entry points for the enemy um, to influence my life. No footholds, no open doors. 
if any of you listening have had a SOZO, you might have heard of some of the language we use in one of some of the prayer tools, which is about a doorway or a door for the enemy um, in which that he might try and influence us. So the, this morning, I want to focus on one of those doorways. And it's, it's a bit of a strange word. I'm just going to come out and say it, but it's the word occult. And it's not necessarily a word that we use regularly. So I was trying to find a simple definition. And I like this one. Anything that involves dealings with the world of spirits or supernatural forces which are not orientated on Jesus. So I think that's quite simple. That's not orientated on Jesus. And there's loads of verses in the Bible and about this. So please, in your spare time, go and have a look. <laughs> but I don't have time to read them out. I'm just going to read a couple. The one from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 and 11. Let no one be found among you who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or cast spells, or who is a medium, a spiritist, or who consults the dead. And there was a word in there that we don't use regularly, divination. And it's just to clarify, it's about seeking to um, foresee or foretell future um, or dis discover hidden knowledge, usually by the interpretation of omens or by the aid of spiritual powers. And we're not talking about Jesus. In the New Testament, in Acts 19, um, we are, a scene is described where Paul is preaching the gospel in Ephesus. People um, got saved after hearing the message. They were baptized. They were filled with the Spirit. And verse 18 and 19 describe some of the consequences of that. Many of those who now believed came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. Uh, and we can easily listen to verses like these and, and easily think, well, this doesn't apply to me, this talk. <laughs> um, I've, I've not engaged with anything that's rooted in the kingdom of darkness. But if we remember that verse we read earlier, um, that the devil is a master of deception. He likes to weave into things which on the surface can actually seem quite harmless. And there's a whole spectrum of, of ways that, um, and he can do this, from really quite more mild things up to much more serious. I've tried to, tried to compile a list, and I'm sure that there is lots missing, but really quickly, uh, some of these things might include having our fortune told, um, use of a crystal ball or tea leaves, um, astrology, so horoscopes, uh, witchcraft, which is a huge thing all in itself, um, any kind of trying to predict the future, for example, like tarot cards or palm readings, um, around the kind of ghost hunting or the seeking that paranormal activity, any form of communicating with the dead, using an Ouija board, using crystals or charms for healing or protection, New Age beliefs, religions that are rooted in deception. So, for example, there's a long list, but just a couple Freemasonry, Buddhism, and finally, one that might be a surprise, it was to me at first um, yoga. And we can hear some of these things and think, well, they sound quite homeless, uh, harmless. But if, if they are rooted in the kingdom of darkness, by engaging in these things, um, we might be opening up that a doorway or an entry point for the enemy to influence us. And I would encourage all of us, if, if any of us have engaged in something like this in the past, just re for, your own, for yourself, just research what the roots are. I'm just going to touch on a few um, this morning just because of, of time. So, First one is horoscopes, and again, that might sound a bit mild. And, and I was brought up in a Christian family, been to church all my life. And I remember, especially as a teenager, the message was, um, we don't read horoscopes as Christians, but it was never really explained why. 
Um, and as we know, horoscopes are about predicting the future. And um, I found a, a good quote from Billy Graham. He said, God did make the stars as well as everything else in the universe, but he intended them to be a witness to his power and glory, not as a means to guide us or foretell our future. And potentially those people who are engaged in, in writing things like horoscopes might be involved in other um, practices that, that we as children of God would not want to get involved in. And we are children of God. We have the most amazing privilege of being able to go to the creator of the whole universe for all of the guidance we might need, wisdom and reassurance about our future. We don't need horoscopes or tea leaves or tarot cards. We have Jesus. He is safe. He is so good. And he is truth. In him, there is no lie. The other one that um, might have made you go, oh, really, <laughs> um, was, was yoga. And, and I never really thought anything of it. I never did it, mainly because exercise has not always made it to the um, top of my to-do list. Something I need to work on. But anyway, um, a number of years ago when um, I was uh, learning about sozos, I was, we were doing a lot of observing sozos and afterwards um, the two ladies were talking, just uh, the people who had led the sozo, and they were talking about how often God brings up um, yoga in um, sozos. And I was sitting there thinking, what, why are they talking about exercise? So I thought I need to, um, if we're training to get into this sozo ministry, I need to look into this a bit more. And um, there's a lot of, thanks to the internet, you can research things really easily. So just a few bits I, I found. So yoga actually means to join, unite or yoke. It's apparently a spiritual discipline which focuses on the harmony of the mind and body which joins or spiritually unites the person to the universal consciousness. So it's not, it, that's some of what it's rooted in. And um, just taken from um, a yoga website in terms of um, just explaining what it is that they do, it said, as a way of connecting to, revering, or paying respect to deities, so that's another word for gods, many yoga postures represent not just what the deity looks like, but also everything that they stand for. As we practice the posture, we put our focus on the energy and essence of that deity and look to embody their qualities. And I'll, I'll just leave that there. But again, I just, in my research, I just thought, oh, that isn't necessarily sounding like it's rooted um, in the kingdom of light. Has anyone listening ever heard of Derek Prince? Anyone out there? Wave. Few people have heard of Derek Prince. He's, um, he's with Jesus now in heaven, but um, he's written some great stuff. And um, it, I just wanted to share a bit of his testimony um, about this. So Derek grew up in India and before he was a Christian, he was really heavily involved in yoga. And so I just want to share his, his testimony. Some of it I'm paraphrasing for speed, some I will read word for word. So the paraphrasing bit. Um, early on in his ministry, outwardly, he looked really fine. He looked really successful in his own words but inwardly however i was battling a tremendous ongoing struggle with depression those around me never had any idea what was going on inside of me for almost day and night during the pe this period of my life i was surrounded by an awful sense of depression it took the form of a dark heavy cloud that would descend over me pressing me down closing in on me and shutting me off from normal communication with other people God revealed to me it was a spirit of heaviness, or in modern English, we might call it a spirit of depression. This was not psychological. I wasn't dealing merely with some entrenched pattern of negative thinking. There was an evil spirit set against me. Then I saw why this pressure got worse the more I wanted to serve the Lord. 
the assignment of this evil spirit was to hinder me in my service for God. Back to paraphrasing. Uh, so um, Derek got set free of this spirit, but he, the, he goes on to say that he struggled to stay free. And God showed him a few years down the line that the reason he was um, not staying free was that he hadn't dealt with, if I use the word entry point or foothold or door. And for him, God showed him that it was his previous involvement in yoga. So now that God had showed him what the entry point was, he was able to deal with that fully kind of shut that foothold or shut that door and was completely um, free and continued to be free. Now I'm not, please hear me, I am not suggesting that everyone's experience who's ever done yoga will be like Derek Prince's. He was heavily into it, but I just think it highlights the importance of looking at the root of what we choose to engage in. And the final one I wanted to look at was um, Freemasonry. I don't know if anyone out there has heard of LL Ministries. It's, um, we really kind of rate them. They do some great inner healing um, kind of work. And um, it just stole a couple of lines from their website about Freemasonry. So it says the, root, the roots of Freemasonry are not only hidden from outsiders, but also from most of the men that get involved. It is only as people progress to higher levels that they discover something of what is hidden. Freemasonry is shrouded in darkness with secret oaths, pacts and ceremonies, and many Christians are unaware of the negative impact that it can have on their lives and on the lives of their family. And I'm just going to really briefly touch on this, but Within Freemasonry, there's 33 degrees or levels, and at each one, different vows or curses are spoken, both over that person and, and their family. And involvement in it can vary, or rather the effects of the involvement can vary immensely, and I don't have the time to go into it, nor am I an expert. <laughs> um, we used to live in Milton Keynes, and, um, we had the privilege of, um, there was an amazing kind of inner healing and freedom ministry uh, base there. And we became good friends with the leaders there. And, and that's where we got trained up to do Sozo. But one of the things that they did was run freedom from Freemasonry days. And the leaders of this ministry said to Mark and I, look, you, you're preparing to go to Malawi. Um, they are great fans of, of people getting as healed up and as whole as possible. And they said, We'd really encourage you just to come along, even if there's no involvement in it, it's not going to do you any harm. So we thought, yep, yeah, it's not going to do us any harm. And at the very least, we'd love to learn a bit more about this. So we went and there were a few people from our church there, which was, was great. And um, one of the ladies um, who went, uh, it's called Barbara, and she has given me permission to share a little bit of her testimony this morning. So um, Barbara had um, had a sozo and due to some of the things that were coming up in the sozo, the people leading it said to her, I would just encourage you just to see if there's any um, Freemasonry in your kind of family line. So she thought, I'm not aware of any, but I'll go and check. And it found out that both her maternal and paternal grandparents had been um, involved actually really quite high up in the Freemasonry. So she got herself hooked on this course. Um, and so just to read a little bit of her testimony. At the Freedom from Freemasonry Day, I wasn't expecting much. My son had been diagnosed with dyslexia recently and was really struggling at school. At the Freemasonry Day, as I was renouncing and then declaring God's promise of something over my children, I felt this mighty whoosh travel up from my toes to my head like something had lifted and I immediately started crying. I had never experienced any mass manifestation other than joy before then, so at the time I was a bit confused. Now I can look back and understand that a stronghold was broken. My son's dyslexia was healed. 
he was reading beyond his age level. My son made an observation when he suddenly started getting really great results on his spelling test. He said, Mum, my brain has been reborn. Now again, please hear me. I am not saying that all dyslexia is caused by Freemasonry, but just for Barbara, um, and this was just her, one of the ways in which the Freemasonry from her grandparents had affected her children. Um, and through Barbara personally kind of closing that door or shutting that kind of um, foothold or entry point firmly shut by going to this ministry, um, her son, to use his own words again, my brain has been reborn. Now, for Barbara, there were other wonderful kind of fruits of attending that day. Um, it, she wasn't a lady we were um, knew really well, but when she joined our church, she was quite quiet and quite broken, and we just watched her transform and blossom. She was she just got hooked. She was on this inner healing and freedom stuff, so she joined the Sozo team. She joined um, a school of supernatural ministry and she just blossomed and blossomed and she's just a powerhouse for Jesus. <laughs> um, uh, so again, that's just her personal testimony. And I just wanted to share that again. It's not, I really want to reiterate, I am not, and she is not saying dyslexia is caused by this. It's just one of, for her, one of the manifestations of, of what had come down the family line. So those are the, yeah, the three things that I wanted to kind of touch on. So I'm kind of starting to come into land. And if you think about that list that I mentioned earlier on, and as I say, there's probably way more things that I could have added. The father doesn't want us, his children, to be engaged in anything that is not rooted in his kingdom. And that's not because he is an authoritarian or strict father but rather as a loving father who wants to protect his kids from harmful things. Any loving parent warns and protects their children against danger, against something which might hurt them or harm them. If a child puts their hand in an open fire, there's going to be consequences. If we open up or maybe another way of thinking about it is if we don't fully shut that doorway, that foothold, that entry point, we may, and I say may, face some consequences in our life that Jesus doesn't intend for us. Jesus died for our freedom, our wholeness. He died that we can live a life free from the enemy's influences. I have no desire to open up any doors or footholds that might um, allow the enemy to have some influence. If I do, I want them firmly shut. I want to live in the fullness of everything that Father intends for my life, and that is all good stuff. So what if we have engaged with something in our past that might have um, given the enemy some kind of foothold. Well, there's some good news. There is freedom in Jesus. There is also no condemnation in Christ. He is not sat on his throne, wagging his finger, disappointed in us, but rather he is championing all of us on to experience all of the wholeness and all of the freedom that he has already won for us. He gets excited. He's like, yes, my son, my daughter is going to get even more free, is going to get even more whole. When Mark and I, and I'm sure Vincent Clear as well, when we, when we do sozos and we watch people literally in front of our eyes get more healed up and free and whole, we love it. We get such a buzz. There's nothing I love more to do. If we love it, how much more does Father love it when his kids want to get healed up and whole and free. So what practical steps can we do to become even more free or whole if we've maybe done some things in our past that were not rooted fully in the kingdom of God? Step one, my advice would be decide to no longer engage with whatever that is, if it's still an ongoing thing. 
if you're if you're not sure do that research what is whatever it is what is it rooted in the second thing remember that passage i i read earlier on in acts when those people that had heard the message from paul they burned their artifacts that were to do with this kind of thing if there is anything physical in our homes that might be linked to anything that I've talked about today. That might be books, photos, crystals, cards, artifacts, anything. I would, like those people in Axford, they burnt it. I would really encourage you to consider removing it from your house. Um, again, if you're not sure about something, research it. Thirdly, ask and receive God's forgiveness. He loves to forgive. Also, ask God, is there anyone I need to forgive about this? Remember my first talk on wholeness. Forgiveness is so important to freedom and wholeness. It might be someone who encouraged you to get involved in something like this. So again, just ask God, is there anyone I need to forgive? And then decide to release that forgiveness. Then ask Father to show you, has it affected me in any way? And if so, how? What has the effect been on me and my life? And it could be really small or it could be quite a lot. But hand it all to Jesus. He died on the cross to take that from you. So give it all to him. And as you give it to him, ask him, Jesus, what will you give me in return? Now I've given you all that not so good stuff. What are you going to give me back? And he is such a good God. Whatever he gives you back will be amazing and receive it. For some people, this might take literally five minutes of prayer. For others, it might be a longer process of walking through and dealing with much more things. But experiencing that he healing freedom and wholeness. So I'd encourage us all, if, if this is appropriate, to kind of work through those, some of those practical steps. For other people, we'd uh, maybe encourage you to come along for a sozo. We love to deal with this kind of thing there. Um, there's some great books around freedom from Freemasonry. Hopefully when this pandemic's over, our friend can come and do some face-to-face -face ministry on it. But those few testimonies that I share give us a glimpse into the freedom, healing and wholeness that is available to all of us in relation to this. Galatians 5.1 says, let me be clear, the anointed one has set us free, not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish this truth and stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. Jesus has won your complete freedom. It's yours to receive. Thank you. That's